Uh, our next speaker this afternoon is Deborah Rogers. Deborah Rogers began her financial career in London working in investment banking. Upon her return to the U.S., she worked as a financial consultant for several major wa Wall Street firms, including Merrill Lynch and Smith Barney. Ms. Rogers then struck out on an entrepreneurial venture in 2003 with the founding of Deborah's Farmstead, an artisanal cheese making operation, and quickly established the company as one of the premier artisanal dairies and cheesemakers in the U.S. Ms. Rogers served on the advisory council for the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas from 2008 to 2011. She was appointed in 2011 by the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality to a task force reviewing placement of air monitors in light of equality concerns brought about by the natural gas operations in North Texas. She is a member of the board of directors of Earthworks Oil and Gas Accountability Project. In addition, she lectures on shale gas economics throughout the U.S. and has appeared on MSNBC. She has been featured in articles discussing the financial anomalies of shale gas in the New York Times and in this month's Rolling Stone magazine. Please welcome Deborah Rogers. Okay, thank you so much for inviting me here today. Um, I know that economics can be very dry indeed, but I'm going to try and make it as exciting as it can possibly be, so you won't fall asleep on me here. Okay, last summer, as he stated, I was involved in an article in the New York Times exposing the anomalies of shale gas. A few weeks after this article came out, the Securities and Exchange Commission began issuing subpoenas to a number of shale gas companies based on the information in the New York Times article. Uh, a few weeks after that, the New York State Attorney General also began issuing subpoenas to some shale gas companies. And then a few weeks, about two more weeks after that, uh, the USGS came out and announced that they were slashing reserve estimates quite substantially for the Marcellus Shale, which is our largest shale play in this country, uh, by 80%. The original erroneous assumptions had been provided to them by, you guessed it, industry. And um, so the Department of Energy followed up on that in January of this year and slashed their reserve estimates for the Marcellus by 66% and the overall reserves for the United States by 40%. So you may well ask, what exactly is going on here? And that's what we're going to discuss. We're going to talk about the money behind shale gas or the lack thereof. These are a couple of headlines that have come out just since the beginning of the year, but I think it's very interesting to, interesting to note because these, as you can see, are from mainstream financial press, Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, and the Financial Times of London, and all of them include bubble in the, in the headline. Now, my favorite one happens to be uh, from where I used to work in London, the FT, who coined the term bubblenomics. I wish I had thought of that, but unfortunately... I didn't. I can't take credit for it, which is very unfortunate. Okay, so what exactly is going on? <clears throat> There's absolutely no doubt the gas exists in shale. That's a given. But shale gas has been touted as a cheap and abundant source of energy. Much emphasis has focused purely on the amount of gas trapped in shales, but much of this gas may never be commercially extractable unless natural gas prices rise quite dramatically. And in that case, natural gas is no longer a cheap source of energy. And this is something which we must all consider when addressing not only national energy policy, but also the questions of how we allow our own regional areas, indeed our own neighborhoods, to be exploited for this resource. The questions facing these t this town, th this region, are the same facing every city or town in every region where shale gas is found. It's important to sift through all the hype and rhetoric to assess whether production can truly be counted on to provide the benefits which industry has promised. For instance, is production as secure as it appears? Will jobs and taxes really be as stable as claimed? What will the environmental impacts really be? And can we count on energy independence from shale gas and unconventional oil? These are some of the things I'm going to quickly address today. I have never, ever seen an investment more hyped than shale gas. Wall Street loves a sexy story, and shale gas provides just that with its incredible horizontal drilling techniques and Hollywood pyrotechnics of fracture stimulation. It started with the Barnett, then it moved to the Fayetteville, the Haynesville, the Marcellus, the Bakken, We've now jumped the pond where they're 
uh, drilling in Europe, in the UK, uh, India, China, everyone's on the shale gas bandwagon. It has truly gone global. All the while, the hype has reached ever giddy heights with every shale play claimed to be better than the last. We've all heard the slogans, game changer, national treasure, shale gas revolution, and 100 years of gas available. But being ever the contrarian, I began to question shale gas several years ago in 2009. After years in the financial markets in Europe and the US, the one thing I've learned is that if something is hyped to this extent, you best beware. Once I began digging, I found that jobs had been overstated, taxes and revenues overstated, reserves overstated, and economic stability vastly overstated. So let's look at some of the claims that have been made, or as I like to say, let's look at some of the rhetoric versus the reality. <clears throat> Jim Mulva, who's CEO of ConocoPhillips, had this to say about shale gas. If oil is the prize, the natural gas is the gift, nature's gift to the people of the world. But Platt's Oil and Gas Reporter, which is a preeminent industry publication, had this to say about shale gas. The switch from shale gas to shale oil suggests that shale gas can survive only through cross-subsidization, not on its own merit. Perpetual expansion cannot forever disguise a serious problem with the bottom line. Mr. Mulva went on to say, the gas can enhance energy supply security through its abundance. There's enough to meet industrial, residential, commercial, and power generation needs. And yet Bernstein Research, which is one of our preeminent financial research firms who specialize in energy, said recent frac data from the Barnett shows a play in severe decline. Forget about those 100,000 wells. It's never going to happen, at least not probably in our lifetime. Companies... Um, this is from an EIA analyst email uh, gotten by Open Records by the New York Times. And he had to say, companies highlight, highlight their highly productive and profitable wells while ignoring their dogs, thereby giving the public the impression that every well is a gold mine. By the way, um, just a quick aside on that, Chesapeake is about to announce um, results from seven wells in the Utica Shale in Ohio, I believe on Monday morning. I can guarantee you those will be not the typical wells. They will be their very best that they've drilled there thus far. So let's have a look at production versus reserves. There appears to be a great deal of confusion, confusion regarding production versus reserves. A leading argument states that shale gas has risen from 2% of all natural gas production in 2000 to 23% a mere 10 years later, a statistic the MIT group calls a paradigm shift. But this is misleading unless put into context. Drilling for conventional gas, and I always have to stop here. Does everyone understand the difference between conventional and unconventional gas? Because I can very, very quickly define it. You want me to define it? OK. Unconventional gas, let's start with conventional. Conventional gas is basically the old-fashioned way of drilling um, a gas well. You have a vertical well bore. You drop it into what you hope you found through your good geology, which is a pocket or a sea of gas underground. You drop it straight down in, and you extract the hydrocarbon. In unconventional gas, they drop a vertical well bore in. When they hit the formation, they go out sideways. They go out horizontally, and it's usually in a spoke pattern, some kind of a spoke pattern. And um, they <clears throat> they then send explosives down and explode the shale every, or whatever they happen to be doing, but in this case shale, about every 50 feet or so, and then the gas rises to the surface. So that's very quickly a definition of unconventional versus conventional. So conventional, or, or the old-fashioned way of drilling for gas, began to wane in this country back in the 70s. When shale gas burst on the scene, of course, Wall Street was only too happy to invest in this new story, and consequently, investment in conventional gas projects has been absolutely decimated. The monies have completely dried up for it. Shale gas has grown as a percentage of all natural gas, but it's been at the expense of conventional gas projects. It is not, it is not adding to existing and growing supplies of conventional gas, but is replacing them. EIA which is part of the Department of Energy, estimates that natural gas will actually only grow at 0.8% per annum from now through 2030. Why? Because conventional projects will be declining and shale gas projects will be replacing them, but you won't, you're not getting both of them um, providing growth. So is this a boom? Well, it's certainly been characterized as a boom, but it makes sense to look at some of the underlying reasons for this production. 
It is a fact that while shale, I mean, while gas prices were plummeting after the economic downturn, many shale companies continued to drill rather than shut in wells, which would have been the traditional approach to low prices for this industry. Shale wells were depleting so quickly, however, that new wells have to be drilled continuously to maintain cash flow. Given the very heavy debt burdens at some of these shale companies, <clears throat> excuse me, drilling was a way to meet debt service. Financial analysts and journalists began referring to this as the drilling treadmill. These companies simply could not get off. That is why gas is at $2.25 today. <coughs> I think one of the best examples of this drilling treadmill can be seen by looking at the audited accounts of the city of Fort Worth, which is where I live in the Barnett Shale. In 2008, the city of Fort Worth got approximately $50 million in gas revenues. In 2009, with the downturn, these numbers plummeted to $19 million, and in 2010, they began trending back up again to about $38 million, to close the year at about $38 million. Now, industry put the spin on this that, see, it was just the economic downturn, we're returning to normal, everything is fine. However, you cannot look at these numbers and just take them at just on, based on that. You have to look at the number of producing wells that were brought online in that time frame, and that's exactly what I did. I went in and I looked and I found that the number of producing wells between 2008 and 2010 within the city proper more than quadrupled. Gas prices averaged $5.37, so they had about a 50% decline and we had about a 300% proliferation in wells. So as you can see, the older wells were declining so quickly that even though they, they kept up this frenzy of drilling all the while, the new wells did not produce enough production um, to keep revenues even flat. Four times more wells could only keep revenues at two-thirds of prior levels. That is a classic example of the drilling treadmill, and we're seeing it every shale play across the country. <coughs> While, um, excuse me, oh, and let me add this in, because this pattern has occurred repeatedly in North Texas. For instance, Denton County saw a 58% increase in the number of wells for a 23% decrease in revenues. The wells at DFW Airport have come in with absolutely dismal returns. Chesapeake needed 2.0 BCF just to break even, and they've consistently come in at 0.9. So they've taken an absolute bath on the wells at DFW. The University of Texas at Arlington saw revenues peak at $7 million with a mere six wells on campus, only to plummet drastically within a matter of months. Revenues in 2010 were down to 800000 even though there are now 22 wells on campus. Drilling treadmill again. <clears throat> so while wells were proliferating and revenues plummeting, gas drilling, however, was providing us with something else, and that was pollution and environmental degradation. The city of Fort Worth released the findings last summer of a report conducted by ERG on all gas facilities within the city proper, and what they found was that benzene, a known human carcinogen, is being emitted at quantifiable levels at 94% of the sites tested within the city proper. We also have other toxics of concern, very high levels of sulfur compounds, including carbon disulfide, which is a known neurotoxin. Um, we also have the dubious distinction of having the highest formaldehyde levels found near a compressor station site on the east side of town that the scientists have seen anywhere on the planet outside of Brazil, where they burn ethanol primarily for fuel. We passed the Houston ship channel's highest ever recorded level for formaldehyde. We, we doubled it in Fort Worth near this compressor station site. TCEQ has now confirmed that the VOCs from gas drilling significantly contribute more uh, than all the cars, trucks, and mobile sources on the road in the region combined. Uh, in fact, the increase, according to a report TCEQ turned into EPA at the end of December, uh, VOCs from gas drilling exceed all mobile sources by 42%. Now, you may be wondering, well, is that really a big deal? Well, yes, it is, because it contributes to ozone, and we also have the dubious distinction now in Tarrant County, which is where Fort Worth is in the heart of the Barnett Shale. Our childhood asthma rate is at an astonishing 25%. The national average is 9% and the state average is 7.4 and we are at 25% for childhood asthma. And you remember Dr. Colburn talked about one of the 
um, the health effects of ozone is, of course, asthma and COPD, other respiratory ailments, and we are seeing that now most decidedly in Fort Worth. <clears throat> so let's move on to record capacity, because industry likes to tell us that we're sitting at record capacity, and therefore they are um, producing a revolution and a game-changing national treasure for us. Um, but this is actually thanks to thousands and thousands of new wells that have been drilled over the last few years, most of which to keep many of these companies from simply declaring bankruptcy. Um, this, in my opinion, is a mismanagement of natural resources, and it has produced record capacity, but it has also driven prices down to 10-year lows. We are now sitting at roughly $2.25. Further, if you are a mineral owner, it is not in your best interest to have your gas extracted right now, um, because while they're extracting your gas and selling it at $2.50, you're being paid essentially rock bottom prices. It makes no sense whatsoever for you, because once your minerals, minerals are mined and or are mined, extracted, whatever you want to say, they're gone forever. And to, to have your minerals taken and you paid rock bottom prices simply to keep companies from declaring bankruptcy is, in my opinion, um, an unconscionable management, mismanagement of resources. So while there's no doubt that we're sitting at record capacity, as I stated, it may be for the wrong reasons. Further, if this capacity is the product of the drilling treadmill, which we have seen, where more wells cannot keep up production because older wells decline so quickly, then I think it can very reasonably be argued that there is very, very little depth um, behind this record capacity or security uh, behind the record capacity because once you let up on drilling, supplies will tumble very quickly indeed. Uh, we are seeing an interesting phenomenon right now. They have announced production cuts. Um, actually, I won't get into that because I, I probably don't have enough time, but if somebody wants to ask me a question later, it is quite interesting. So record capacity, however, instills a notion in the public that shale gas is both cheap and abundant. And this may, in fact, be nothing more than a false sense of security. <clears throat> Excuse me, my throat is a bit dry. So one statistic that's bandied, bandied about is that the U.S. has a 100-year supply of gas, um, thanks in large part to the shale plays. But we now learn that government estimates have been dramatically slashed and further that EIA, a, EIA's original erroneous assumptions were based in large part on data provided by the industry. By the way, Poland just came out last week. Poland was touted to be the savior of Europe for shale gas and they just uh, slashed their reserve estimates by 85 to 90 percent. Again, their reserve estimates were based on, uh, thank you very much, data erroneously provided, or erroneous data provided by industry. Um, so this is not a phenomenon that is uh, curious just to the U.S. Uh, something else which is very important to consider is that these estimates do not take into account the cost of extracting the gas. They're just simply, um, reserve estimates, and this is where I'd like to go next, to the financial anomalies that have cropped up with regard to costs and SEC reporting and even shareholder value destruction. <clears throat> According to the product, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to do this. According to production history filed by the operators in various states, shale gas volumes have not turned out to be as homogeneous as once thought. In the earlier days of the plays, it was said that you could just drop a drill bit in and hit gas anywhere, and we know now that that's not the case. In fact, there are core or tier areas, um, fairways, they, they have all sorts of different names for them, but it turns out that these are not manufacturing models or shale gas factories after all. Aubrey McClendon admitted to Bloomberg that there was a time when you were all told that any of the 17 counties in the Barnett Shale would be just as good as any other county. We found out that there are about two or two and a half counties where you really want to be. I've been working for the last couple of years with some geologists down in Houston, and they have now pulled production history from the Texas Railroad Commission. And I, I want to make it very clear that these numbers that I'm about to discuss are um, based on actual well production numbers filed with the state. There's no wiggle room in these numbers. These are not pie-in-the-sky projections. They're not, um, they're not wild-eyed assumptions made by eco-freaks or anything else. They're, this is actual well production. So far, they've actually examined more wells, but when I made this slide, 
9,100 of the 15,000 wells in the Barnett had been examined at this point, and they found that 94% of them are losing money. 6% of the wells in the Barnett Shale have met minimum economic thresholds. About a year ago, I entered an email exchange with Dr. John Lee, who's now at the University of Houston. Uh, yeah, Houston. He was at Texas A&M. He is a petroleum engineer, and he was the architect for the Securities and Exchange Commission's rule change for oil and gas, which we're going to get to in just a moment. And Dr. Lee had this to say to me in the email. He said, it is sometimes said that 20% of shale wells carry a project the other 80% can easily be uneconomic. Now, I have been making the argument for a couple of years that I'm not convinced that shale gas is the highest and best use of the land. Because of the way they have to go in and fracture stimulate these wells, it is very land consumptive. Uh, you, it takes an enormous area of land, and we have it here from industry insiders. The actual architect for the SEC rule change for oil and gas is telling us here that 80% of the wells can easily be uneconomic. Now, um, we have seen good examples of what I, I think my case is becoming much stronger. If you take Chesapeake Energy's uh, press release of about a month ago where they announced they were going to shut in wells and they weren't even going to bother to hook up some wells to pipelines because they had been, they're just not economically viable. Um, that land has been used. Those wells have been drilled. Millions and millions and millions of dollars have been spent to drill these wells, and yet that land will generate no revenue, no tax generation of any kind going forward. It's just been trashed, bas basically. And uh, so I think my case is getting much stronger that this may not be the highest and best use of the land. <clears throat> This is a very damning slide. This is from the geologist that I've been working with. Every place you see blue is literally a carpet of wells in the Barnett Shale that covers a number of counties. It is literally a carpet of wells. Uh, these wells run about half a mile to a mile north, south, east, and west. Every place you see a red dot is a well that made money. <clears throat> I like to just sort of pause for a moment here and <laughs> let everybody take that in. <clears throat> no, you probably can't even see the red dots. Um, let's see if I can work this new technology. There's a few there, and they're right in there. So, but they're, they're very few. 94% of the wells have not met minimum economic thresholds according to production history filed by the operators within the Barnett. And I can actually give you other information. I, I don't have time to do it today, but I've done a lot of work on estimated ultimate recoveries of wells and what the operators promised to financial investors. I've done a ton of work on that. And um, essentially, they overpromised or overstated reserves by at least 100%. At least 100%. Okay, so now let's get into the SEC rule change now because this is where the claims of Ponzi scheme and Enron moments came in according to emails written by industry insiders of the shale companies which the New York Times did such a brilliant job of exposing. <clears throat> Since the SEC rule change for oil and gas was adopted in 2009, companies can now claim reserves that were previously not allowed and book them without a mandatory third-party audit. I have absolutely no problems with them claiming um, greater um, offsets from the wells. I think there was a very valid, valid argument to be made for them to be able to do this. Uh, the problem that I have is that the SEC went on because uh, they were under a lot of pressure from these companies. Believe me, I read every single one of the comment letters, public comment letters. Uh, they were under a lot of pressure, and the SEC went on to allow them to do this without requiring an, an independent third-party audit. Now, this is obviously problematic. There's a clear upside to being able to book more reserves. You can make it appear that your growth is occurring within your company and that finding costs are plummeting. But is this really the case? Well, let's have a look. Mark Papa, CEO of EOG Resources, told financial analysts that those that select to book liberally can have extremely low finding costs, and those that book more conservatively, and he's talking about booking reserves, could have higher finding costs. EOG went on to increase reserve estimates by more than 135% under the new SEC rules. Other shale companies did the same, and some increased their reserve estimates by as much as 200%, literally overnight. Such massive reserve revisions obviously can make a company appear to be much more attractive than it may really be. 
And the other problem is we don't really know whether these reserves exist or not because they have not necessarily been independently verified. But even more problematic than that is that by booking these reserves, it allows these companies to immediately go into the capital markets and borrow more money. So they have leveraged up on reserves that have not been independently verified. Borrowing more money on assets, as I stated, that have not been independently verified is very problematic indeed. <clears throat> but, overall, but while overall costs did drop during 2009, the dramatic drop in costs seen in some shale companies cannot be explain, completely explained away by this factor. So I thought we would have a look at that. Finding and development costs, according to Ernst & Young, decreased an average of 48% in 2009. These declines were driven, you don't need to know that, it's kind of boring, um, but at five of the seven shale gas companies that I studied, costs, these costs dropped significantly more than the overall average market decline for their industry. These were the same companies, in, interestingly enough, that had chosen to increase their reserve estimates substantially, some by as much as 200%. So let's look at some of these. PetroHawk's finding and development costs in 2008 were $51.50 under the old reserve estimates and then plunged in 2009, literally overnight when the new rule went into, into effect, to a mere $7.03 under the new estimates. This is an overall decline of 86%. Comstock Resources and PetroQuest also had similar declines in excess of 75%. Range Resources and Chesapeake Energy tied at 66% declines, well in excess of the average of 48% seen amongst all oil and gas producers. And EOG was the only company that came uh, whose cost declines were more in line with the average, and they were right at 48%. Obviously, again, I can't say this enough, these plummeting cost figures raise questions because the reserve estimates they are based on have not been independently verified necessarily. Further, many companies in their reporting also have not included sunk costs, such as lease costs. By breaking these out, they can make it appear that costs are lower still, and leases, but leases have to be paid for. You just can't leave costs out just because it looks better. Um, you have to, um, at some point, factor them back in, and when you do this, what we found was that costs began to rise significantly once again. <clears throat> Actually, uh, this is, I think I can do this. Um, this would be kind of interesting. This is actually, I've, I've got my notes in my slides a little bit, um, not, not, they're not jiving, but um, this is interesting. I went in and started pulling the comment letters of the SEC to these shale companies over the last couple of years because I wanted to see where, if I could get an idea of where the investigation is going. By the way, the investigation is not anticipated to be uh, completed before t the end of 2012, so we'll probably be in 2013 before we hear anything. Um, but this is interesting. This is on PUDs, what the industry calls PUDs, Proved Undeveloped Reserves. And it, it sounds complicated, but it's really not. What it is, is uh, the industry can claim, they can book reserves called PUDs, and um, but they have to, under the new rule change, they have to show that they will develop those reserves and move them out of the undeveloped category on their financial statements into the developed category within five years. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. As you can see, this is according to Oil and Gas Financial Journal. None of the main, uh, or many of the main shale gas companies are able to prove that they can move their PUDs off. Now the reason the SEC has this, this is simple investor protection. Um, what you don't want is to allow a company to claim reserves and just leave them on their books forever when they have no intention of, of actually developing them. Because as I stated, they can borrow money on these claimed reserves. And so this is a, it's a, it's a precaution, it's a, it's a, uh, check and balance that the SEC put into place. But as you can see, it's not working very well. Devon Energy, according to Oil and Gas Financial Journal, um, uh, it would take them 9.1 years to move them off their books. Range 11.8, Chesapeake Energy 13.1, Apache 15.1. None of them are in compliance with the SEC rule. WNT Offshore, I just threw in for a little comic relief because it was so outrageous at 104 years that I, after you've been doing this for a while, you know, you, you think things like this are funny. Um, but uh, anyway, as you can see, none of the major large independents are in compliance with the SEC rule at this point in time. Um, so no doubt that's part of the investigation. Um, 
So let's begin to put this, this puzzle together. Production is at the expense of conventional gas projects, so it really isn't as great as it seems. Reserves do not have to be independently verified. Jobs have been overstated. By the way, I didn't talk about that. I, I, I took those slides out just for time, but I do want to make this point. I did some work on this just last week when I was in New York. Um, when you look at the low point for oil and gas extraction workers, according to the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, the low point hit in 2003 roughly 10 years ago at about 118,000 jobs. I went and I extrapolated forward and I looked at oil and gas extraction workers. And keep in mind, this isn't just for shale gas. This is for all oil and gas workers in the US onshore and offshore. Those numbers had grown to 186,000 in roughly nine or 10 years. Okay, that is a net job gain of 67,900 jobs during a time of game-changing revolutionary activity. To put it into true perspective, that job gain is 1 20th of 1% of the overall labor market. So this whole argument about drill baby drill is going to produce jobs is just bogus. It certainly hasn't. They've been drilling, we're at record capacity, and we've had a net gain onshore and offshore, oil and gas, of only 67,900 jobs. We've got 12.8 million people unemployed currently. That's not a game changer. So, as you can see, jobs have been overstated. Revenues and taxes have been overstated. Well, decline curves are very steep, so security of supply is questionable. Reserve estimates have jumped considerably on company books, but estimates by government have now been slashed significantly, and industry insiders consider that 80% of shale wells could be easily uneconomic. To my mind, this is a very alarming picture. So then we get to the question that I always get, so I'm going to preempt you here and answer it. Um, so, because someone's going to ask it otherwise. And that is, if shale gas is such a dud, why are the majors, and most especially the foreign majors, falling all over themselves to invest in shale gas? Over the last few months, near record prices have been paid by foreign entities uh, for U.S. assets. Eight billion dollars in deals was consummated in the first two weeks of 2012 alone. Why? It's a very valid question. Well, the first thing you have to keep in mind for any publicly traded oil and gas company is that there are essentially two sets of economics. I refer to these as one, the field economics, which is what are the wells actually doing? What are my costs? You know, what is it costing me to frack them? What's it costing me to drill them? Um, what's actually happening out in the field? The other set of economics, which is completely different, is what I call the street economics. And that is, what do I need to make my financial statements look like? What do I need to tell uh, financial analysts in earnings calls that will make them interested in my company and keep my share price on an upward growth trajectory? Those are two very, very different sets of economics and they do not always jibe. That is very important to keep in mind. So keeping that in mind, it is a fact that the majors, and this is across the board without exception, whether you're talking about ExxonMobil or um, Total, which is a French major, or Sinopec, which is a Chinese major, the majors globally have not been able to grow reserves in over a decade. If you're an oil and gas company and you can't show growth in reserves, then your stock price is ultimately going to languish at some point because you can't show that you are, are that you, you can grow any longer and your company is going to begin a retraction process at some point. So the majors have not been able to grow reserves in over a decade. If a company, as I stated, so um, because they can now buy up the shale gas reserves essentially, uh, they can now, it, it can now appear that a major is on a growth trajectory once again. But again, these uh, reserve estimates have not necessarily been independently verified. That's one aspect of this. I think the much more likely aspect of why the um, majors are interested in this is that the price of natural gas in the rest of the world is indexed to the price of crude. Someone brought this question up earlier, and I'm going to address it head on here. Um, because I think this is a very important point to grasp. The majors are in the business, well, any oil and gas company is, but particularly the majors are in the business to extract hydrocarbons and get them to the client that will pay them the most money for them. And that is not the US domestic market at present. Uh, that happens to be Asia at present. Right now, they can extract pipe, ship, refine, 
to gas to Asia if, if they had the permits in place, which they got permission. I'll get to that in just a moment. But anyway, they can do it for $9, and today, right now, in China, they will be paid $16. That is a very nice spread, $7 spread right there, right today. Not five years in the future, but today. Um, if oil prices continue to rise, if we have any sort of interruption in the Gulf, you will see natural gas prices in Europe and Asia continue to rise as well, and that spread will just get larger and larger. So who do you want to sell your product to if you're in the business to extract hydrocarbons and get them to the, the person who's going to, or the entity that's going to pay you the most money? You don't even have to think about that. It, it's a, it, you know, it's a complete no-brainer. Somebody who's going to pay you $2.25 in the United States or somebody who's going to pay you 16 in China. Now, what we've been seeing is very interesting. The industry has been very, very publicly extolling the Pickens plan and other plans lately, over the last few years. And they've been very, very public about this. Uh, and the rhetoric is that we can be energy independent all thanks to shale gas, and uh, we need to convert our power plants to run on shale gas because it's cheap and abundant. And I've just shown you that it may not necessarily be cheap and abundant. And um, we need to convert our truck fleets to run on natural gas because it's cheap and abundant. And we need to make our cars run on natural gas because it's cheap and abundant. Um, but what they have not been public about, and yet what they've been working on diligently behind the scenes for several years, and they have been talking to financial analysts about this, uh, is um, exportation of shale gas. They went to the Department of Energy several years ago and began putting pressure on them to allow them to flip existing LNG, which is liquefied natural gas terminals that are already exist in this country, of which there are eight. They have put in permits for all eight terminals to flip them and make them export terminals. And as we speak right now, just from those eight initial contracts, uh, they have committed 20% of our shale gas supply already for exportation. I had been making the argument that this will, because um, the international pricing pressures, when you have a, a client that will pay you $16, U.S. domestic prices are not going to remain at $2.25 when you have that kind of international pricing pressure. So prices will ultimately go up once shale gas exportation begins. EIA came out and backed me up on that just a few weeks ago and said that they anticipated prices rising by 54%. Uh, for shale gas exportation, I think that's a very conservative estimate. I think it'll be much higher than that. But you're getting the idea. So essentially, to my mind, um, by the way, the first permit was approved by the DOE uh, in October, last October, for gas to be exported out of the Gulf of Mexico. The other seven permits are still in. They have hit an interesting glitch. I've referred to this as the clash of the titans because um, I thought this was a bit naive, actually, of Dow Chemical, but Dow Chemical actually believed in the argument that shale gas was cheap and abundant, so they made a big fanfare about um, we're going to open up more manufacturing plants, particularly up in the Northeast, and bring manufacturing jobs back home. Right? And then they found out that they were going to export shale gas, and they figured that math out pretty quickly. And now you have the clash of the titans. The chemical industry is now leaning on the DOE from this angle and the oil and gas industry from this angle, and it'll be interesting to see who wins in the end uh, because those prices will not stay that low um, once exportation begins. <clears throat> um, I wanted to include both of these comments just because this reiterates what I've been talking about and I think it, it's just become so straightforward what's happening here. All this rhetoric about, I call it wrapping ourselves in a red, white, and blue flag and proclaiming energy independence is just that. It's just rhetoric. Uh, the Chinese, this is according to Oil and Gas Financial Journal, the Chinese are willing to pay a premium to secure North American resources necessary to feed the growing Asian economy. Our natural resources will be used to grow other economies. Uh, and this quote from Shell, you just can't get any more straightforward than this. Um, Shell has placed a big emphasis on North American gas. It's an area of growth for us. We've invested something like 15 billion since 2004 in the onshore sector. What we develop here, we'd like to export to the rest of the world. Okay? So the next time you hear Boone Pickens on television touting, you know, energy independence, just do whatever you like. <clears throat> Okay, we talked about that. Now, here's what I foresee. I call this a classic consumer squeeze. 
if we do begin to convert our power plants to run on natural gas, if we do convert our uh, truck fleets and our cars to run on natural gas, and then we begin to export at the same time, then the domestic price, as I stated, will rise um, to meet the international pricing pressures, and we will be caught in the classic consumer squeeze. We will find ourselves in the exact same boat we find ourselves in currently with crude. We will be much more dependent upon natural gas uh, as an energy source, and um, uh, the price will be much higher. But I thought, just for fun, that I would let Aubrey McClendon, CEO of Chesapeake Energy, explain what will happen if natural gas prices go through the roof. Mr. McClendon inadvertently stated the consequences of high natural gas prices only a few months ago at the Marcellus Shale Convention. He was referencing what would happen if operators were not given a completely free rein to drill in the U.S. Oddly, I find Mr. McClendon's logic flawed almost every time he opens his mouth um, because we're already sitting at $2.25 and if they give him even more opportunities to drill, that's just gonna drive the price even lower still. But he hasn't quite worked out the laws of supply and demand yet, I guess. Um, odd, <clears throat> nevertheless, he does give a very concise and reasonable exposition on what will happen if natural gas prices, and these, these, were, his, these, were, his, these were his words, if natural gas, gas prices went through the roof. 70% of American homes on natural gas heat will be cold, he said. 35% of American homes and businesses and factories that use electricity from natural gas will be dark, and crops that require natural gas fertilizer will not be grown. He himself referred to this as a very stark future. I could not agree more, but um, he and his colleagues will be very, very rich indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now you Question? can blast me with questions. <laughs> yeah, Ed. So the question is, is it going to collapse in the bubble, or will it actually go up? Okay, I don't have a crystal ball, but here's what I think is going to happen. Um, the large independents are under enormous, enormous financial strain right now. Um, ExxonMobil came out in their analyst call just a few weeks ago. Someone asked them, they said, are you going to cut production? And they said, absolutely not. I knew what the answer was going to be before they answered, because that is the perfect business decision for ExxonMobil to make. Why? They are the largest producer of natural gas in this country. They alone probably can keep prices depressed as long as they want, and that's probably exactly what they would want to do. Keep them depressed, drive these large independents into their arms. They will pick up the companies like Range Resources that have good management teams um, and nice assets. They will just scoop them up in the same way that they scooped up XTO. Um, and some of the other companies that they don't want the management teams, they'll simply go in and cherry pick the assets. Now, the problem is now you're dealing with the majors and that is a very different game altogether. These companies are not highly leveraged. They are sitting on mountains of cash. They can afford to sit this out for years and years and years. So it is absolutely imperative. Um, I think that we have a bit of a window here because natural gas prices are so low. And by the way, some very credible analysts like Barclays um, Bank are, and, and others are actually saying that gas prices could actually go to zero. Zero. Because they're, they've drilled so many of these wells, it, it was a drilling frenzy to keep this, the, the appearance that this game was working and they had to meet debt service, and the only way they could do it was to keep drilling, 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 drilling. And so even though they've now announced cuts in production, it turns out that they haven't really cut much. Um, imagine that. Um, and um, so that's why prices have fallen s since Jan the end of January when they announced these production cuts. Chesapeake, for instance, just came out the other day and said year over year uh, production cuts would amount to 4%. That isn't going to make any difference whatsoever. So um, the majors will just sit this out and then they'll just cherry pick assets 
And I think it is absolutely imperative that we um, go into our communities and implement the strongest possible ordinances that you can imagine. I mean, truly, whatever you can imagine, because as I stated before, it is the height of naivete to expect these companies to think this area is beautiful and, and you know, love it the way you love it and protect it the way you love it. That is not their job. That is not their business. They are in the business to extract hydrocarbons and get it to the client that will pay them the most money. Thank you very much, Deborah. Thanks so much. Thank you.